my name is Jake Drew, and I'm the Chief of Orthoplasty at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Today, we'll be discussing indications and instrumentation for total hip replacement. My disclosures are seen here. The objectives of this discussion will be to review appropriate indications for total hip replacement. We'll also discuss preoperative patient optimization. Finally, we'll review the various approaches for total hip replacement and some important instrument considerations. So the appropriate patient who is a candidate for an elective total hip arthroplasty is a patient with irreversible intraarticular pathology of the hip joint that has been refractory to non-operative treatments and who is healthy enough to undergo surgery. And so some examples of those irreversible intraarticular pathologies that affect the hip joint would include degenerative joint disease. Certainly osteoarthritis is the most common diagnosis encountered in patients requiring total hip replacement. There are also various inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis. Osteonecrosis, particularly if it's progressed past the point of subarticular bony collapse, is another appropriate diagnosis leading to hip replacement. In the trauma wards, we see displaced femoral neck fractures, particularly in the elderly population, sometimes leading to total hip replacement. And sometimes in patients, a labral tear may be an appropriate indication if they are of such an age or the tear is of an anatomic variant that is not likely to heal with surgery or other methods. Surgery is generally not our first treatment option when considering these various pathologies of the hip joint. Uh, most patients will undergo a period of non-operative treatments. These treatments can include anti-inflammatory medications, as long as the patient is able to tolerate those medications. Generally, the patients will modify activities, uh, avoiding those activities which cause the hip pain to be worse. Physical therapy can occasionally be helpful, and sometimes we can provide intraarticular corticosteroid injections, often using ultrasound or x-ray image guidance uh, to ensure accurate placement of the corticosteroids. These can all provide temporary relief, but ultimately many of these patients uh, prove refractory to these treatments and therefore become candidates for total hip replacement. Now, prior to the surgery, we absolutely need to assess the patient's overall health status and make sure that they're an appropriate candidate for surgery. Now, sometimes this leads to identification of various modifiable risk factors and it is generally our obligation to put these patients in the best possible situation to have a successful elective surgical procedure. And so some of these risk factors here, malnutrition, smoking, diabetes, colonization with MRSA, uh, can all be addressed preoperatively that's not to say that we can completely eliminate these medical comorbidities, but we can ensure appropriate treatment uh, and control at the time of surgery to optimize our postoperative outcomes. Much work has been done in this space, and various publications show that many of these modifiable risk factors confer a substantial additional cost if not addressed prior to surgery. Here, malnutrition, diabetes, obesity, and infectious diseases such as AIDS all contribute to higher costs associated with an increased risk of complications following hip replacement surgery. Many of these same variables are listed here, including anemia, narcotic use, or tobacco use. We routinely employ a screening and treatment strategy to identify those patients with MRSA colonization and treat them appropriately preoperatively in order to minimize infection risk. 
We ask our patients to quit smoking six weeks in advance of surgery, again, to minimize their risk of perioperative complications and or readmission. Our diabetic patients are asked to maintain tight blood sugar control. This often requires us to collaborate with endocrinologists or primary care physicians to make sure a patient's diabetes is appropriately managed in the months leading up to surgery. Those patients with malnutrition uh, may be at even greater risk for perioperative complications than the obese patients. Either one of these patient categories uh, requires close attention prior to surgery for optimization. Again, here malnutrition plays an important role in the risk following total joint replacement surgery. And so at our institution, we have uh, an active program which identifies these modifiable risk factors in the period of time before surgery. And if any of these factors are identified in an individual patient, we'll do our best to employ the appropriate interventions to help modify those risk factors. Again, we may not be able to eliminate these comorbidities, but certainly if we can optimize a patient's nutritional status or anemia, or make sure that their diabetes is well controlled leading up to surgery, then certainly their risks of complications uh, will be diminished. And so we have an obesity cutoff of a BMI around 40. Um, if we identify malnutrition via laboratory evaluation, we will provide oral supplements leading up to surgery. We ask all of our patients to quit smoking six weeks prior to the operation. And we also require abstinence of excessive use of alcohol or recreational drug use. Uh, preoperative anemia can be treated with iron supplementation or erythropoiet. Uh, we do screen patients for MRSA colonization, and those who are found to be colonized are treated. Uh, diabetics are required to maintain a hemoglobin A1C less than 8, preferably less than 7.5 prior to surgery. Uh, studies have shown that these numbers predict better glucose control in the immediate post-operative period, which is perhaps most important. Uh, we employ a multidisciplinary approach and we'll work with primary care physicians or various other specialists to make sure that treatable infectious diseases are addressed prior to surgery. And of course, psychiatric illnesses such as depression need to be carefully assessed. So with all of this, Considered, it can seem sometimes that the perfect total hip replacement candidate is a bit of a unicorn, uh, but it is our obligation to help these patients uh, achieve the best possible outcome, and doing so sometimes takes a considerable amount of effort prior to surgery. Now, prior to surgery, I also would advocate for uh, accurate preoperative planning. Uh, we have digital templating software that interfaces with our PAX radiology system uh, that we use to plan for the appropriate implants, sizing, and positioning. Uh, there are certainly hard copy templates available that serve the same purpose. Preoperative templating can guide me towards an appropriate femoral neck cut. And the preoperative templating can also guide us towards appropriate position of the acetabular component. So when we're reaming our acetabulum and we re refer to that template, we can determine what amount of medialization is appropriate based on the reconstruction we have planned. And then ultimately our reaming continues until we achieve the other goals beyond medialization. We want to ensure that there is appropriate bleeding bone around the periphery of the acetabular component. And we want to make sure that that final reamer uh, has a great press fit so that the acetabular component will be stable once impacted. We spent a lot of time considering uh, risk factors for medical and post-operative complications. Surgeon also has to consider the risk factors for instability. And many of these are not modifiable. For instance, dementia or various neuromuscular conditions 
Some patients uh, are extraordinarily flexible, such as those with connective tissue disorders or Down syndrome. And there are certainly personality factors to take into account prior to a hip replacement. Uh, some patients may be uh, less able than others to follow the hip dislocation precautions. They may be risk takers or impulsive or have certain activities that lend themselves to risk of dislocation. And these factors all need to be taken into account when considering the surgical approach. And so it's important that regardless of the surgical approach, a well done surgery with appropriate technique will provide a predictable operation. Now that said, there are various pros and cons to the commonly employed approaches for total hip arthroplasty, and we will review those here. So the anterior approach has certainly caught on and gained popularity in the United States over the past decade or so. Uh, various other approaches have been commonly employed historically, the anterolateral, direct lateral, and perhaps the, the most commonly employed approach uh, over the majority of the total hip arthroplasties performed in the United States has been the posterior approach. Each of these bring forth a set of pros and cons. Certainly as the direct anterior approach has gained more popularity, uh, surgeons have relied on that and have referred to the possibility for earlier and quicker recovery. Uh, the direct anterior approach, however, does provide only limited access to the posterior column, and it can be a challenge when inserting femoral components that require long straight reamers. Uh, the direct lateral approach uh, does, in many variations, um, require taking down a portion of the abductors. This risks a Trendelenburg gait. Similarly, the anterolateral approach can also require taking down a portion of the abductors and risk that same Trendelenburg gait. That said, the direct lateral and anterolateral approaches have a much lower rate of dislocation compared to the posterior approach. The direct anterior approach, as more people have uh, taken to this technique, we have recognized that there may be an increased risk of femoral fracture particularly during the learning curve. And there is also an increased risk of wound complications, particularly in those patients with an overhanging pants. Many surgeons employ a special table or require an extra assistant to perform the direct anterior approach. And, and these can certainly be downsides, especially in resource limited environments. And so in summary, the direct anterior is is certainly a, a viable option. It can be performed with or without a specialized table and carries a very low dislocation risk with easy access to a supine intraoperative x-ray. The lateral approach has the lowest dislocation risk of those discussed here, but there is a higher incidence of a Trendelenburg gait related to the requirement of a partial takedown of the abductors. Similarly, the anterolateral approach has a low dislocation risk and this may be an approach that's less familiar uh, unless you're one of those who had extensive experience with it during your training. Uh, the posterior approach generally is considered a technically simple approach. It's familiar to most, but it does come with a higher risk of dislocation compared to these others. So with the anterior approach, one of the potential downsides is the need for a specialized table to elevate the femur and provide the appropriate exposure. You can absolutely do an anterior approach without such a specialized table, without additional assistance to run that specialized table. And so it's important to recognize that doing an anterior approach with or without a specialized table can each yield excellent outcomes without difference in risk for intraoperative fracture. Now, personally, I'm a bit of a minimalist when it comes to instrumentation uh, to achieve exposure for total hip replacement. And so whether an anterior, direct lateral, or a posterior approach, I try to limit my retractors to two at a time. Uh, two retractors at a time helps me limit the amount of surgical assistance required for the surgery. Uh, 
And I also find that the more retractors in a wound leaves less room for the surgeon to use additional instruments to achieve the task. And so here, this is a femoral exposure. This is an anterior approach, but this is equally effective for a posterior approach. I try to put one retractor uh, anteromedial over the calcar and another retractor uh, around the posterior aspect of the femur or for an anterior approach just over the greater trochanter. I find that two retractors provide a perfectly adequate uh, visualization of the proximal femur to perform an accurate position of components. Likewise, for the acetabulum, I, I really dislike the idea of having, in this case, six different retractors in the wound. There's just no need for that many retractors in most cases. And so most of the time, I'll simply use two retractors. Typically, one is anteromedial, adjacent or over the pubis, and another is posterior or posterior superior, either with a sharp, wide Hohmann retractor, such as that seen in the bottom right corner here. We can actually impact into the ischium, where that spike will provide a firm seating of that retractor, or just over the posterior superior aspect of the acetabulum. Either way, in the vast majority of cases, two retractors apl applied in the appropriate position provide excellent exposure. Now, again, I think it's important to remember that regardless of the approach or what types of retractors you use, a well-done hip replacement is going to deliver a predictable positive outcome the vast majority of times. So make sure that your visualization is adequate in order to perform the steps of the operation. Make sure that your patient has been appropriately selected and undergone the preoperative optimization of modifiable risk factors. Uh, templating, whether electronic or hard copy, can certainly provide an added benefit of appropriate preoperative planning that can facilitate accurate component sizing, positioning, and bony preparation. Thank you so much.